just by way of welcome, I would like to also add that this is a, a, a sad, very sad moment for the Diocese of Greensburg and at the same time an historic moment. It gives us a wonderful opportunity to pay tribute to Bishop Anthony Bosco, who of course, as you know, is a native of Pittsburgh, and the wonderful legacy that he leaves the diocese, not only after his 17 years as diocesan bishop, but also through his manifold, many uh, different kinds of activities uh, he engaged in in ministerial ways after he did retire. So uh, I think perhaps your time would best be spent if you could ask me any questions or uh, whatever that you would like to present and I could respond to them in a, in a, uh, in a concrete, as concrete a way as possible. Can you just talk a little bit about um, Bishop Bosco's legacy and the mark that he left on the Diocese of Greensburg? Mm -hmm. uh, those who knew Bishop Bosco I think would agree that he, he was a, a very bright person, a man of eminent good common sense, uh, a very spiritual person and a person gifted with a, a beautiful sense of humor which could be uh, acerbic at times but very much on target. And so with these, this combination of gifts he was able to endear himself to many people. He, uh, he was always, uh, I, I always enjoyed my lunches with him. We, we had lunch together frequently and I always enjoyed my lunches with him because you, you laughed a good part of the time and, uh, and also it was a chance for me to access his wisdom. Of his 61 years as a priest, he spent 43 as a bishop, which is rather extraordinary. He had a long, long tenure in leadership positions in the, in the Catholic Church and it was certainly a church that he dearly loved as he dearly loved the Diocese of Greensburg and the Catholics here, the faithful in this diocese. So he, he had a wonderful experience, a very broad experience of church and leadership in the church and he brought all of that uh, back in his wisdom in the way he ministered here and shepherded the Diocese of Greensburg in so many ways. I think when people think of Bishop Bosco who made, his, made one of his significant marks in the diocese and also nationally, they think of Bishop Bosco as a person very much, through, very much involved in media throughout his whole priesthood. And this began actually with KDKA. He had a relationship with KDKA radio during the Second Vatican Council. He hosted a television program. He uh, wrote a column for our diocesan uh, paper. Uh, it's called A View from the Bridge, his column. And uh, he also established our radio program, Accent on the Air. And he gained national prominence as the uh, chairman of the United States Bishops Committee on Communications. So he, he really was interested in communications. He was a very good uh, interviewee uh, and uh, he made certainly a name for himself uh, in that area. Also, not just nationally, but uh, as you can see uh, closer to home in Pittsburgh, but also in our diocese. He was, I think one could fairly say, quite a bit ahead of his time by the innovations which he brought to the diocese. First of all, he, he looked upon communications technology as a wonderful way to evangelize, to spread the faith, to hand on the faith, to give witness to the faith. And due to his conversational skills, his sense of humor, his theological depth, he was a, a natural at communicating. And he did it so well and so this was a, also a natural outlet for him so to speak and this concretized itself here in the diocese uh, by his first of all uh, establishing a diocesan uh, internet website and through this web through this internet connectivity uh, to connect every parish in the diocese together 
And this network, our diocesan internet network, uh, is called HALO. So that was, I think, way ahead of its time. And in fact, there are many dioceses, many dioceses today, which do not have that. Uh, and it's, it's a wonderful facilitation for ministry in this diocese in, in all of its dimensions, not only administrative, but also educational, the way it connects our schools, our parishes. So he was, he was quite a bit ahead of his time in that regard. And uh, as I mentioned, we had a radio program here, Accent on Air, and uh, his, his uh, work was recognized when in 2001 he received the Bishop John English, uh, John England rather, award which the Catholic Press Association gives for those who defend the freedom of the press and religious freedom. So he was recognized on a national level as well for his work in communications. So I think that would be one significant part of his legacy. And I think another significant part of his legacy is, was his emphasis on catechizing lay people and involving them in the leadership of the church. In that sense, he was also quite a ways ahead of his time because it was only much later, in fact recently, that the United States bishops published their document, uh, Workers in the Vineyard, about lay ecclesial ministry. But decades before that, Bishop Bosco was engaged in uh, involving lay people in the ministries of the church, bringing their charisms, their talents, their perspectives to what the church, to the challenges the church faced and to spreading the gospel. So he issued a, uh, a pastoral letter, New Wine, New Wineskins, laying, laying out how the laity could be become involved in church leadership through parish pastoral councils. And that document is a landmark document, really. And as I say, was, was uh, way ahead of its time. So because of that, uh, we also, because of in, his interest in, 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 in the laity and lay ministry, lay ecclesial ministry in the church, he established a new structure in the diocese. He divided our deaneries, which you might say for, for a diocese are like counties, uh, counties, deaneries are let's say counties, and he subdivided the counties into regions. And each region in, in the diocese is presided over by a priest who is a, a co-chair and also a layperson who is a co-chair of those regional councils, something uh, which was, and, and I think remains to a great extent, an innovation. So it was another way that Bishop Bosco wanted to bring the laity and all of their gifts to the the uh, teaching, sanctifying, and shepherding ministry of himself as a bishop and also uh, in the diocese. So I think those are, those are two ways which, uh, which uh, characterize the, the unique contribution of Bishop Bosco. And also, of course, he, he was very intent upon, he was an educator, and well, he was a communicator, and communicators make wonderful educators. And so, he, uh, he wrote a pastoral called Journey of a Lifetime about continuing education in the faith. And also he wrote another pastoral letter, Taste and See, which established catechetical guidelines for the diocese. So that was while he was, was a bishop. But even after he retired, he was still involved in education. He taught a theology course at Seton Hill University, our local university here, one of them. Uh, and he taught a theology course there. And he also taught a distance learning theology course for the University of Dayton. And not only that, in his retirement, he had a Bible study group in his own home. Uh, I think it was every two weeks. And he also uh, established a prayer group in his own home. And in fact, when I went to get my hair cut this morning, the man who preceded me in the barber's chair was a member, happened to be a member of that prayer group. So he, uh, he told me what a, what a great experience that was and how grateful he was to the bishop for that. So due to those initial 
qualities that I identified with Bishop Bosco, he was an excellent communicator and an excellent educator. So he was a tremendous asset to our diocese. Not only that, he was responsible for another first in this diocese. The diocese was established in 1951 when Bishop Lamb, uh, who was an auxiliary bishop in Philadelphia, came here as our first bishop. And it was not until the year 2000 that we had our first capital campaign. The goal for the campaign was 25 million. We raised, he raised 28 million. And typical of Bishop Bosco, he thought that the work of the church and the particular areas of that work that he was especially interested in and especially wanted to promote could best be promoted and advocated for if that campaign were to establish endowments, endowments, for instance, for lay education, endowments for clergy education, endowments for uh, catechetical ministry and so forth. And those endowments were established through that campaign and they continue today to help people become catechists in the church, do lay ministry and so forth, the things that he was, the very things he was interested in. So he, he not only talked the talk, but he walked the talk. And uh, he did it in a, in a, in a beautiful way. Which, from which we benefit today richly. So Bishop Bosco was a, a tremendous gift to the diocese. He was a tremendous asset. And I know that his legacy will continue to live long, long into the future because we have benefited so richly by it. I wondered if you could talk briefly about, um, like a lot of dioceses, he faced a changing economy and uh, in, in declining membership in some time periods. And what, how he confronted that? Mm -hmm. Well, as we all know, in the 80s, the, the local industries that supported uh, our population and our population growth at the time was steel and coal. And those uh, industries began to flag in the 80s, and uh, therefore it contributed to a, a dwindling demographic, dwindling population, the jobs were not here, people were not coming here, people were moving out, and so forth, so it contributed also to an aging population at the same time. And Bishop Bosco was confronted with that, as we still are confronted by the same dynamic in parts of our diocese today. So Bishop Bosco studied the situation, and it was very clear that we had too many parishes, uh, for really too few people, engaging too many priests to serve too few people. So he had the courage to address this. He closed par some parishes. And of course that was really, I think, a shock to many people because under his predecessor and in the, the halcyon 60s and 70s, things were booming, things were growing. Uh, but there were evidences all around us Look at the U.S. Steel Building in downtown Pittsburgh. How many times that has changed hands, how many times that has changed names, and look what the name is on it today. So we have in this area have been, and still are, involved, uh, especially in certain places, in pervasive change. And of course, uh, if you address change, uh, you make changes. It unsettles people, it shocks some people, and it shocked a lot of people because really uh, they hadn't experienced pervasive change due to a changed economy. Those were the first, the first beginnings of this. And uh, Bishop Bosco did have the courage after serious study and prayer to close certain parishes for the reasons I mentioned. And of course that caused various, uh, various levels, degrees of opposition in, in various places. But uh, we, we are still really confronted with that same dynamic, for instance, in, in Fayette County, in our diocese. The very same dy dynamic we have in Fayette County, we are bearing four people for every one person we baptize. And uh, that, is not a good, that is not a good demographic relationship. Uh, so we still are dealing with the same thing and uh, we too are finding uh, presently also on the basis of our strategic planning process which we began in 2006, implemented 
2008 and are still implementing that we have to do many of the same things uh, in, in certain parts of our diocese. Certain parts are growing, thank God, but in certain areas there are just simply too few people and a dwindling number which of course impacts everything in the, in, in the region. But he, he did have the courage to, to, uh, to face uh, misunderstanding, to face opposition, and he was deeply convinced that he was doing what he did, what he felt he had to do for the greater good of the church so that we could, uh, we could consolidate and combine resources and serve the people better rather than have a lot of very small struggling parishes around, combine them, combine their resources, personnel, finances, ministry resources, and we can serve the people better. So I think it was a, it was a process basically of consolidation. And uh, uh, that's, he addressed what, for the first time really in the diocese, uh, what had to be done and which we, as I say, on the basis of our strategic planning process, are still engaged in to a certain extent. Just by some factual, um, I understood that his death was somewhat of a surprise. Had he, had he been ill? No, he, I mean, he had not, not been ill. Uh, he had no uh, terminal pathologies. Uh, uh, he had celebrated Mass last Sunday at the cathedral. Uh, and in fact, uh, I talked with a neighbor of his last night. He, he died last night, late in the evening. And this neighbor said to me that he had talked to Bishop Bosco at, at 8.15 8 and he was found dead at 10.30. And he was, uh, he was sitting in his chair watching a Pirates game. <laughs> so it was a, uh, he, just, uh, he just sort of slumped over in his chair a little bit to the left and, and uh, just entered eternity. Do they think it was his heart, or has anything been said about that? Nothing has been said about that, but it must have been sudden, because he had just talked to somebody at 8.15 and was fine. He wasn't asking for help, or could somebody come over, I feel I'm in difficulty. And then uh, he, the neighbor came over, called him later, and couldn't get him, and couldn't get him. And so then he came over uh, and uh, found him, and then he called me. So it, it it really was unexpected. I think we noticed uh, in, in recent weeks that he, he was looking fragile. It wasn't looking ill, but I mean he was just, he was just looking fragile. And uh, more than one person commented on it, so we were, we were kind of concerned about him and monitoring him. But uh, I mean it wasn't as though we felt we were dealing with a terminally ill patient or you know a significantly ill patient. He just uh, did not demonstrate those kinds of symptoms at all. And this was at his home? This was at his home, and yes. And where is that? It's, uh, it's right behind the Bishop Kinnear Center. Geographically it's Unity Township. Uh-huh, yeah. But he died a very peaceful death. He, uh, uh, in a way, you know, he was spared a lot. Cancer victims, you know, they they linger on and and just uh, have to endure a lot of protracted pain, and at least he was spared that, it seems. <laughs>